Uh, good evening, everyone. Good evening. We're going to discuss. Um, I'm Abhinav Chinani from the Stoop Design Forum. I would like to discuss this subject through this parameter towards an Atmanirbhar Indian architecture. The idea is to make Indian architecture not only go local, but also go global. I'm just showing you some of my work, but most of this presentation is about work done by various architects in India and overseas, and work which basically is a tentative towards making Indian architecture become truly global. Let's begin with Le Corbusier. We know that the Architects Act itself, the Architects Act of 1972, will be in its 50th year in the year 2022. It's a great occasion because 50 years of architecture being official. I'm sure by then we should have an agenda to make architecture come of age. Chandigarh, you know, was a catalyst. It was the idea of Chandigarh was to have a catalyst, to have an infusion of international thinking in Indian architecture. And once the more, one of the most significant events that had taken place was to invite an international architect to come here, dialogue with Indian architects and infuse in India a new aspiration. The intervention of Le Corbusier had tremendous impact. It generated a new breed of Indian architects who embraced modernity and began to interpret a new India in a modern language. Architects like Balakrishna Doshi and Charles Korea went on to become great masters. They went on to win the Pritzker Prize. We are very proud of them. And they also were known for designing in a language which was both modern and yet rooted to the Indian context. And I feel this is very important when we debate architecture and Indian architecture. Another architect that I personally worked with was Joseph Allenstein. He was an American architect who worked in uh, New Delhi and of course uh, India for a long part of his career. And he built some of the most interesting buildings in New Delhi and other places across India. His architecture and that of Laurie Baker were basically rooted to nature and materials in the context of the Indian construction environment. This is the India International Center designed by Yodha Valenstein and the India Habitat Center. I had the good fortune of working with him and seeing how close to nature his architecture was. And of course, my first house was designed with Laurie Baker and I noticed how close to materials and the kind of design, the construction technologies and just the kind of spirit of India that was actually there in the architecture of Laurie Baker. And then you look at some of the new interventions in architecture. When you look at how Indian architecture begins to globalize itself, this is Amravati that I'm showing you. And you know that firms such as Foster and Partners, Fumihiko Maki, Zaha Hadid, Skidmore Owings in Merrill, I am Pay to name just a few, have now envisioned major projects in India. Other firms such as RSP, HOK, and Enya are executing major projects presently. So what is this contemporary international intervention post-liberalization? What is its meaning? Has it got the same kind of impetus as Chandigarh, or is there a commercial logic to this? Buildings like these designed by I am Pei mm. are impressive in themselves, but in terms of the Indian architectural debate, what do they contribute? What do they contribute in terms of what is going to become of Indian architects and Indian architecture in the future? So what contributions have these firms been making to the historical discourse of architecture in India? This is Fumi Hikomaki out here, Nalanda. What is Indian architecture gaining from these interventions? Now, I have personally worked on an airport project on a, in a collaborative manner, in an equal collaborative footing. This is the Hyderabad International Airport Project where I collaborated with international architects. And the whole idea was to have a transfer of technology between the West and the East and for India to develop world-class international airports. This is the Hyderabad International Airport where I was a joint concept architect. However, there's a flip side to this coin. Even though this was designed in 2003, today in 2020, the international terminals in India are not being designed by Indian architects. They're being designed by international firms. And there are great work being done. This is the interior of Hyderabad International Airport. Although Hyderabad International Airport was very, very international in its outlook, 
it had several features which had an Indian touch. There were these kind of, instead of using skylights and direct lighting, there was this kind of indirect lighting, which was inspired by, let's say, the leaf of a temple tree. The entire scale and movement of this building was actually envisioned at a very human scale, unlike other airports where you get completely lost in the entire immensity and the, the vastness of space. In fact, projects such as metro stations, railway stations, even churches, museums, temples, and mosques are now being designed by international firms across the country. Tender practices are such that turnover criteria is being adopted without considering the exchange rate and international CVs and international projects are being given higher value in their assessment. This is some images of the uh, Hyderabad airport. Almost 70 years after Kabuzia came to India, Indian architects are not considered worthy of executing major projects across the country. I know the statement will be controversial, but I would like to say that why not, that after so many years, almost 70 years of Chandigarh, right, why should Amravati be designed by an international firm? It shouldn't Indian architect be coming of age. For example, this concept, the concept of the airport village at Hyderabad International Airport was a complete Indian concept. It came only due to a true collaboration between Indian and international architects. Because we as Indians, we knew, and my firm Stoop knew, that actually in an, to, in an airport, the meters, greeters, beepers, and waivers, as we call them, they need a space, and they need a kind of a low-tech, naturally conditioned space where they meet, greet, and this has become a new vernacular in Indian architecture of, uh, of terminal buildings. This, what we call today, an airport village. These innovations come through a true collaboration. The idea is that today, Indian architects can design on their own. This is, by the way, this we did Hyderabad Airport in 2003. Now, through a great struggle, we've managed to get the Amravati Airport, okay, which is basically uh, a mid-sized airport okay, in uh, Andhra Pradesh. You can see out here uh, an airport in the Lakshwadeep, which is designed like the Stingray. The one in Amravati is inspired by the Krishna River. I won't go into the details of that uh, project. And this is another, uh, this is the airport in Nagati. So while we are getting opportunity to design airports, some of the largest and most interesting projects are actually not coming our way. Indian architects have been able to go overseas. We're going to see some other works of other architects here overseas. And there are so many Indian architects like Charles Korea, Raj Reval, uh, Balakrishna Doshi, was so capable of doing fantastic work globally. This is the project that we've executed. Actually, this is in Ghana. It's the uh, seat of government in Ghana. And we had an opportunity to go as an Indian architect internationally, collaborate with uh, you know, international architects of the country and come up with something which is specific to the country and also unique to the world. And this was in competition with the, with, with the leading practices of architecture in the world. Perhaps now, almost in the 50th year of the Indian architect, it is time to benefit for Indian architecture, not only to go local, but also to go global. There is a lot of talent in India, tremendous talent. I would like to just take you through some images. This is, for example, the development of the design. We believe that design should be very contextual. It should not be just planted. I'm sure every architect in India believes that. We come from so many different contexts. India is almost a number of countries and cultures linked together. So when we design, we design very contextually in India. We did that in this particular uh, project. We used the experiences we had in India and built a narrative architecture. This building is designed is called the seat of government. It designed like the throne of the Asanti king. Ghana is called the Gold Coast, so we've got a kind of a gold texture in the building, but we've used environmental per perforated skin, okay, like a veil, almost like Salim Chisti's tomb, which actually naturally ventilates this building. And you can see, both in terms of the architecture and the engineering, the technology of this building uses passive design, which is something that we do every day in India. I believe some of the greenest buildings that were made in India were made in the 70s, you know, and of course, the proudest thing that can happen to an Indian architect is that he goes overseas and he designs something and what he designed finds itself on the currency note of that country. It's worth more than an award anywhere else. So we're just showing you some images of this one particular project. I'm not going to be showing too many of mine, but you know, this is a, this is a project I'm particularly happy to have worked on. It's the expansion to um, 
Louis Kahn's I Am Ahmedabad, which I had an opportunity to work on. And this is what I'm really talking about. If Chandigarh was built in the 50s today, right, an Indian architect should be expanding Chandigarh. And that will be really carrying the spirit of that architecture forward. I'm personally very, very happy that Bimal Patel and HCP have been provided the commission to take forward Lutyen's vision of the Central Vista. Whatever may be the controversies around it, whatever may be the issues, I think the idea that an Indian architect should take on a project of 250 crores <clears throat> makes a lot of sense. This is a project I've done in Cambia, but I'm going to be more talking about the uh, various questions that I would like to pose to the panel. The first question is, Indian architecture is varied and unique, and it is time to use the momentum to go local and, and also to go global. Let's begin first with these questions. What is an Indian architect? Who is an Indian architect? How do you define an Indian architectural form? I'm sure Habib would be able to give us, uh, enlighten us about that when he speaks to us. Is go local the right strategy? Is it protectionism? And protectionism, is that the right way to grow and develop and deliver international quality projects? By isolating ourselves, will we be able to be truly international? Or should we consider an alternative mm -hmm. strategy? Create a level playing field. All international architects to compete on level terms with reciprocity. This is something that I'd like to table. Maybe an ideal world, but it's something that's interesting to have. What skills and competences do we need to augment to achieve this goal? What help do Indian architects really need in delivering international quality architecture? And then, why can't Indian architects get important international commissions? So, uh, I, I would like uh, Habib to take the next presentation. Thank you, Abin. Should I as I can? Uh, uh, we have to look at the whole issue which have been just pointed out from a legal point of view, a statutory point of view, or from the Council of Architectures point of view. The, I am going to tell you very six uh, uh, different steps in which we are thinking and what we can do to you know, work on this particular aspect. First is re redefining of architectural services, and there have been a lot of uh, issues concerning uh, architectural practice and architectural services, wherein um, the Supreme Court has recently told us it was there in the Act uh, since 72 that only the title and state is protected and is not the uh, architectural services. So we are trying to amend the Act and we are trying to redefine architectural services. And what is being pr proposed is on the right hand side, which you can uh, go, go through. But I'm not going to go through it. I go. I'm not going to describe it in detail. But we need to first of all consolidate and define our own base before you know before we actually go ahead with anything else. We need to redefine and consolidate our services first. Second is the legal and the administrative administrative base that we want to have, in which we can have global competitiveness and parity. We also need to have large setup of offices to be internationally viable. We need to have funding in our architectural firms, and that will pave way for growth. So we're looking at LLPs, limited liability partnership, and we're also exploring the possibility of having an architectural private limited company. We're talking to various agencies and various stakeholders concerned in the entire legal and the administrative setup. So this uh, will pave way for large architectural firms to not only fund, go for equity, and uh, pave way for growth internationally as well as nationally. Uh, we are also going to introduce, this is the main uh, issue concerning uh, why Indian architects cannot go and practice abroad or why can our practices not go uh, global, is the issue that our registration at the moment happens only on the degree or the B arch degree that you get after five years of your study. We are proposing a paritable framework with the international uh, uh, level of uh, practices where you have a professional examination, a professional qualifying examination to be a registered architect or to be a chartered architect. And these practices are followed internationally, except very few countries which do not follow this practice. And uh, this examination will give you international compatibility. It will give you paritable registration. It will give a standard, standardized framework and it will pave way for reciprocal arrangements. And this is a very important uh, uh, step in the, in the entire process of uh, not only going, going global, but will also pave way for uh, 
you know, reciprocal arrangements, and that's very important. Now, in this reciprocal arrangement, uh, we have been talking to a lot of countries. A uh, lot of countries uh, uh, we have been discussing since long, and recently we have been discussing with a lot of South Asian countries. Countries like Bangladesh, or Sri Lanka, Malaysia, Thailand, Philippines, they're all having uh, professional qualifying examinations. We do not have a professional qualifying examination. We do not have accreditation of our architectural schools. So what is happening is mm. our architects who are registered with the uh, Council of Architecture in India do not have paritable basis and equitable basis to practice in London or Africa or anywhere else, Australia, USA, anywhere else that you say, because our uh, registration process is not equitable to the registration process elsewhere. The most important aspect of the entire thing is that was talking of is the improvement of architectural services. We need to self introspect what kind of uh, quality of architectural services we provide, whether it is the quality of drawing work, whether it is quality of deliverables mm -hmm. that we have, or uh, whether the uh, entire uh, method and documentation processes that we follow in our practice, uh, that needs to be upgraded, that needs to be augmented. So uh, we need to look at self introspection of what we are uh, what we are doing at the moment and what we need to do. We need to look at the quality of services that we provide. Services means the dealing with the clients, dealing with the uh, legislative uh, procedures, le dealing with sanctions, dealing with architectural drawings, BOQs, estimates, and the delivery of the project, quality uh, inspections, and everything. And the methods of documentation of the entire process needs to be looked at. Quality of services and paritable with other countries. Now, for this, we are uh, almost on the, uh, you know, qu move quite ahead in making a manual of architectural services, which will become a comprehensive and holistic document defining everything mm -hmm. to do with uh, architectural services. It will become a new Bible for architects, like we have the National Building Code. And I'm very happy to say a very empowered committee and a very learned committee is working on this, and we have uh, progressed quite a lot. And by by, I am targeting year end where we'll be uh, we'll be rolling this out. And this will be the game changer for architectural practice. If we are able to follow the, the manual of architectural services, we will be able to be at paritable level with the architectural services that are provided by the international firms or by anywhere else in any other country. Another most important part uh, I, I feel is the awareness of architecture and architectural services not only amongst our own fraternity, but uh, in the society at large, augmentation of knowledge, upgradation of knowledge, and awareness outside fraternity. For that, we have already started the outreach initi initiatives, which you all, you all of you would have come across, the COA social, web, print, and you know, not only to augment the knowledge of the architectural fraternity, upgrade themselves to international levels, upgrade themselves to uh, national level, uh, if you can uh, call it, but continuous upgradation of knowledge is very important. And we need to be updated with the international processes. We need to be up updated with the uh, quality uh, architectural services. And that we have already started that. We already rolled that out. But there are thoughts to ponder that we need to look into. Uh, what are the roadblocks? What are the drawbacks? Uh, what is the questionable intent of the foreign firms coming here or we going abroad? And what is the harmful content in the entire policy that will be rolled out by the government, by the council, and you know by any other statutory authority? And what are the limits and restrictions? Like we have recently heard there's a 200 crore limit. I don't know whether it is right or wrong. We need to really look into it, introspect, and uh, weigh the pros and cons before we agree to it. We need to look at the reciprocal arrangements and the opportunities abroad. How many architectural firms or how many uh, related firms will come to India, which they are already coming and bagging a lot of projects and doing a lot of large scale projects? And how many Indian architects would be able to go out? I mean, I mean, I can I can count the architectural firms, Indian architectural firms who are going abroad and doing work on my fingertips. But we need to look at the large scale of practice. Uh, 70 to 80 percent of architectural firms will they be able to go abroad, even if they are able to provide quality services? Will the global market open to them? We need to sign various treaties and accords like the GATT and the Canberra. Our schools are not accredited by the Canberra Accord. Um, we are talking to the NBA, National Board of Accreditation, we're talking to the NAC for uh, doing this. And once we do that, our architects, graduate architects, whether they are registered or not, whether they're chartered architects or not, will be able to get employment abroad of, in all those countries who have signed these treaties and accords. We need to look at the taxation issues, which are a very important part of foreign firm coming here. Now working here, getting the architectural fee, but the fee goes to the headquarters, you know, and uh, what about the taxation? We need to 
uh, sort this out with the Ministry of Commerce and Ministry of Finance. And there are many more uh, which need introspection, uh, uh, which are tangible, which are intangible aspects about changing of the mindset of not only the government, but the clients, but the society and our own architectural, architectural fraternity. Unless the mindset is changed and unless there are two aspects, reciprocal aspects. The first is that we need to upgrade our services. We need to upgrade the quality of architectural services that we give and the quality of output that we give. And that loved with the changing of the mindsets where we know the society tells us that the Indian architect is equally compatible with any international firm and the quality of output that he'll give and the quality of services that he'll provide will be at paritable level and equitable level with any international firm. I think the mindset will start changing. So these are a couple of more intangible aspects, which I'll not discuss now. Maybe in question answers, we can discuss that. But these are uh, five or six points that I have just discussed with you. Five points and the sixth point is uh, I'm not being negative, but uh, some kind of a you know, uh, introspective thought process has to come in. What are the drawbacks of the whole process and how we can address those drawbacks? Thank you. Really wonderful, Habib. Uh, thank you for, and we can see a lot is happening at the council and you really have a mountain to climb and we'll climb that mountain with you. A uh, lot of great thoughts, a lot of great- You need to push behind, you need to push from behind. Yes, and the idea is for the entire architectural community to come together and make something happen. It doesn't happen just through one leader. It happens through the support that is given by each one of us. So, Godspeed. Uh, yes, I have to can... ask uh, Lalita to, uh, you know, take the mantle now, you know, and take us through her presentation. Okay, can I start? Sure, go ahead, Lalita. I'm hurt, right? Okay. Yeah. Hi, uh, so just trying to present a couple of works uh, since we have been collaborating with uh, architects internationally and uh, we have been participating in a lot of uh, competitions which are uh, international but also, uh, you know, for Indian projects, international competitions and various international competitions across the globe. Uh, starting with uh, the first uh, project which we were uh, one of the five shortlists in uh, Manila in Philippines. Uh, this was in collaboration with uh, J. Meyer Edge from uh, uh, Berlin. Uh, in fact, uh, we kind of collaborate on various aspects and not just about projects, but also uh, in general design research. Uh, so uh, the main peeve that we, you know, most of the firms have is that when uh, international uh, uh, firms come across and collaborate with Indian firms, we just become, we become the, uh, we kind of become mere uh, execution uh, architect or, you know, the paper architect and most of the design and the, uh, the entire concepts are done and designed by the international firms. Uh, but uh, uh, to say that we have uh, kind of deterred from uh, accepting any such kind of proposals from any of the international architects who wanted to collaborate with us and we uh, collaborated only on the terms that it should be an equal collaboration from uh, the from the start of the conceptualization to the end of the project uh, so here also i wish i mean paucity of time i cannot really show you the kind of process that we have gone through in this particular project uh, but uh, this was uh, one of the iconic tower which was uh, you know uh, which was initiated by the government of uh, uh, Philippines and uh, what they were looking for was uh, it was supposed to be a collaborative effort between the government and a private party to build a commercial tower in a district which was uh, quite a commercial uh, area which uh, had a lot of other commercial buildings around it and the footprint of the site was pretty limited and uh, small. Uh, the, the reason uh, that if you see our building is uh, uh, is, is in fact uh, pretty limited because the uh, kind of requirement or the uh, program that was there was precisely for building about four lakh of square feet of uh, space. And, uh, you know, Jurgen comes from a background which is German, which is highly practical in designing and thought process. So considering all those aspects and the discussions between the two firms, we came up with a building which was probably one of the shortest amongst uh, the, you know, uh, of the five uh, proposals that were given to uh, the, uh, to this competition. Uh, 
because uh, we did not want to overbuild because ultimately it was supposed to be a commercial project and we did not want to take it over and uh, make it into an unviable uh, you know a uh, project which would not be and but ultimately we did not win the project it was won by henning larson and uh, they in fact uh, uh, and it it was the tallest building which was proposed in the competition and it was one of the tallest building they proposed in the entire uh, malela uh, so they won because uh, they understood the uh, the basic essence of uh, what filipinos are uh, they love drama and uh, on uh, asking Oh, you know what was the uh, the aspect of their design that they liked was it was about drama and things like that. But uh, ultimately, uh, it was an unviable project because a lot of uh, uh, part of that uh, project that was proposed was uh, empty space and uh, it was not viable for any commercial uh, person to come and build that ultimately. And uh, so to say that project has not really taken off. Uh, second is the uh, project that was an international competition which was happened in our own country in Delhi. Uh, a lot of international, in fact, almost all the international firms participated uh, from Zaha to uh, everybody that we can name, all the star architects participated. Uh, we were one of the seven finalists and uh, the this was in fact located in Luton's Delhi uh, and uh, you know, we reinterpreted the brief and this whole uh, whole thing to make it into peace museum because uh, so Indian services are not just about war. Uh, we of course did need to represent and uh, tell the history about uh, what what wars we have fought and what how we have won and other things. But we also wanted to show that uh, Indian services and uh, you know all the forces are always there when it comes to peacekeeping, uh, be it in our regular you know timelines, be it help at any point of time when there is a calamity, natural calamity also. So that was the entire thing. And since it was based in Newton's uh, Delhi, we wanted to make sure that even though it had a very contemporary modern approach, but it had to have the essence of the uh, architecture around uh, in and around Newton's Delhi, which was uh, the essence. And of course, height was a restriction because it was uh, in the uh, area where uh, uh, where they had a limitation of height not going about the parliament. Uh, this is another uh, project which we had again participated. It was a, a competition in uh, Dubai. It is in fact uh, situated in the Dubai Creek area where the tallest uh, tower in the world is being done by Calatrava. Uh, and this was in the same uh, location. It was uh, in fact uh, pretty uh, it was straight in the same uh, area, which uh, kind of was right next to the creek. And the, again, the footprint was a limited footprint. The requirement was far more, but the collaboration in this case uh, is, of course, I'm sorry, forgot to mention that we had uh, collaborations with all the international, uh, you know, uh, consultants like Arup and uh, others in the previous project, which was the War Museum. And that gave us a lot of insight and a lot of learning. Similarly, in this particular project, also we had collaboration with a lot of international uh, consultants who kind of uh, made it possible for us to have uh, a very contemporary, iconic uh, structure to be proposed in a mosque, uh, which was not a typical mosque with four minarets and you know, a typical dome. Uh, but we kind of designed uh, the largest uh, semi-dome, which was self-suspended in this particular case. And this all could come purely because of the uh, international uh, collaborations we had. Uh, this is uh, a very, very tiny project, which was, uh, again, a competition where we uh, came in uh, uh, fourth. Uh, and uh, we was one of the, sorry, we were one of the four, four uh, shortlists. Um, it was uh, the Israeli lounge in the Kennedy Center, and uh, it was a it, it was a project which called for a multi-use uh, space. And as you can see in the plans, that we propose different uses. And uh, uh, in terms of collaboration, when we are talking about uh, international architects, yes, we before we even went to uh, present this. Uh, a particular project, we made sure that we had an international because if this, if we would have won it, we had to execute it, of course, in Washington, D.C. We could not, uh, you know, sit over here and do that, even if we had to go over there and execute it. Uh, it would have been difficult because you would need the, uh, 
you know, every state, as we all know, that he has his own certification, they need its own certification. So we had to uh, collaborate with an architect uh, based in Washington, D.C. In this particular case, uh, the architect based in Washington, D.C. was uh, purely for the exhibition purpose. The entire design and concept was uh, done by us at Collaborative Architecture. So uh, further discussions, which, uh, you know, Habib has already mentioned, we can uh, do while, while discussion. I just wanted to take you through what we have been doing. There are many other projects. As we speak, we have already entered a couple of projects that we could not show. We have collaborated with Henning Larson for the uh, Musi River in Hyderabad also. Unfortunately, you can't show that because again, the results are not out as yet. As we speak, we have participated uh, in the uh, rethinking of the uh, Brooklyn Bridge also. Uh, again, uh, the jury is still to sit on that project. And all this was with collaboration, uh, international collaborations, uh, wherein, uh, you know, uh, we got in a lot of uh, input from uh, the consultants which could give a different dimension, a different different direction altogether to uh, our proposals at the end of the day. And uh, how we got in touch with Henning Larson is because Henning Larson was the winner in a BCDA project in Philippines. And uh, that's how we kind of got connected and Henning Larson uh, approached us to uh, collaborate on equal terms for the Lucy River. So I will stop that presentation. Thank you. That was wonderful, uh, Lalita. Great to see uh, the work that y'all have been doing. And uh, uh, I think I think it's a good time for us to ask Ben to uh, present his work. Uh, it's good. Thank We've you. seen uh, an architect who's been collaborating with international architects across the world. We have the president speaking about what is going to happen. And now we request Ben to tell us what has been happening, and he's looking at it from the international collaborative architect perspective. Go ahead, Sven, speak about uh, your experiences. Thank you so much, Arvin. It's a pleasure to be here and to contribute to the panel. Um, well, I would like to firstly emphasize the importance on the design process, on the development of the concept design for the buildings. As we all uh, know, that is like the key aspect during any design. So having worked in India for um, 15 years, starting in 2005, um, I felt that one of the major challenges for international architects working in India is to understand the um, FSI, the Floor Space Index. And during any um, project, um, the architects teams have spent a huge amount of time in firstly understanding it uh, and then developing a, a scheme out of it. Um, as we know in India, the FSI rules are very strict and they are seriously limiting the um, concept development uh, stage. Um, many developers are trying to get as much area uh, free of FSI as possible, resulting in different designs. This is why I feel many projects in India can only be located in India because of these uh, very strict FSI regulations resulting partially in more or less uh, inefficient buildings um, because of these FSI regulations. So perhaps that would be a great opportunity to review these, to simplify these, to allow architects more room to make the buildings even more efficient. I would like to show two um, projects I've been working on in India. Um, my first one in uh, 2005, there I was working with uh, GMP architects and led by Schleich Bergermann and partner. Professor Mike Schleich, uh, the appointment was for the new roof structure of the Jabahal Nehru Stadium. Great experience, um, great working in the team of structure engineers based in New Delhi. And as we know, the quality of the project, of course, depends on the architect, on the engineers, and so on. But also, it depends a lot on the client. Um, 
who is asking for world-class projects, but at the same time has to allow an approach providing sufficient time for the concept design and further detailing. So here on this project, we were lucky working uh, with our client, the CPWD, the Civil Public Works Department led by Mr. Chakrabarti, uh, who actually made this possible uh, in the design process. Second project, which was not executed, um, but again with a very challenging um, client um, for uh, DB Realty, the India Tower, that was um, during my um, assignment with Foster and Partners in um, Mumbai. Also a very inspiring project, um, working with international and India-based consultants uh, on this um, project. And again, only the combination of all team members and the client made it possible to come up with an uh, inspiring design like this. That's it uh, from my side, just to give you a brief overview. And we still continue to work in India. Um, so our office is in Mumbai, um, founded in 2009. And what we're doing is we are focusing on the project management part of projects from our Indian clients, international clients, and German clients in order to streamline the design process of all project stakeholders involved. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Sven. Um, Vinalini, it's your turn to speak. Uh, tell us, you've been listening to all these thoughts and discussions, and you yourself are an architect who's basically studied overseas and then come to India, been in education. So you could probably enlighten us. What's your perspective on this entire subject? Uh, well, I'd first uh, begin by apologizing for not having a presentation because it was, um, I was occupied with another engagement today. Um, but I think what's really interesting is that there's, there seems to be a paradox that we're talking about. On one hand, um, and allow me to kind of, you know, jump right into a discussion. But um, on one hand, we're talking about Indians wanting more projects in India and trying to question the idea of why international architects are coming and taking up projects that could otherwise be given to Indian architects. And on the other hand, we're talking about Indians going abroad and practicing abroad and doing projects abroad. And I think there seems to be some sort of a unresolved sort of friction in just that statement because, you know, if, if we're looking at a democratic system, then, and if we want to be able to practice abroad, then what stops anybody else from coming into our own country, right? Okay. And that's just, that's just a fundamental question that I would have, not being an architect, but just being a global citizen, is that if, if you want to go out, why would you, you know, block your borders from somebody else coming in? Mm -hmm. And that is a question that I would, in fact, pose to practicing architects today. That's and a fantastic question. Actually, actually, that's the premise on which I, uh, you know, when you come up with this whole concept of go local, there are a lot of people who are going to be very, very happy saying, mm -hmm. that, okay, look, because, you know, it's also a fact. Let's look at these metro stations being built all over India. Yeah. You know, you may be aware that most of the design, the general consultancy for the metro stations are given to international firms. And uh, you talk about 200 across, and Habib Khan was talking about whether 200 is why 200. This is a debatable issue. Let me tell you what they do is they take 25 metro stations, club them together, and they take out a tender for 25 metro stations. So obviously, you're going to be seeing something more than 200 across. You know, sure. there are many yeah. loopholes in this kind of discussion. So one thing is that, look, we are a country in which there is international intervention happening. and there are occasions where someone like Larissa is working on an equal footing, but there are also other equations in which international architects are coming. They're controlling the projects. They want the Indian architect to be a local architect to just kind of sign off the drawings, and then they are moving on. So there is one aspect of it is this. And the second aspect of the paradox is, so here you come with an idea that Atman Nirvan, you know, uh, uh, Atman Nirbhar Bharat, and you say, look, you're going to have 
all projects worth 200 crores being done by you. So two questions there. One, look how prepared are we to do all these projects firstly, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And the second question, okay, which is also uh, important, okay, is that why? Why instead of doing Atma Nirbhar Bharat, meaning, sorry, I'm talking more about Go Local, there's something different between Atma Nirbhar yeah. and Go Local as well, okay? I'm saying be Atma Nirbhar, but need not be Go Local, you go global, okay, and allow global to come and play here. I'll give you a cricket analogy. The IPL, right? What it did to Indian cricket, it brought international players here. They all played together. They competed with each other. They collaborated, so to speak. And now the Indian cricket team is amongst the best in the world. Sorry about a cricket analogy, but you can see that happening. Look, today we should have the confidence to take on the world. Okay, so I don't know whether this is all a positive sign. By being isolationist, right, you don't become globally competent. So you hang on, hit the uh, paradox in this entire premise. Swen, what is your thinking about this? Yeah, it's a, it's a very valid point. Uh, on one hand, um, trying to go local and uh, limiting the international input in India I would feel uh, design competitions should uh, should allow um, to decide w which is the best design, no matter of the origin. I agree with you, Habib. You would have something to say about design competitions in India, you know? We, uh, before before the design competition thing, I would like to say that we are not on an equal playing field. We're not on a level playing field. You know, foreign architects can come and practice here in collaboration with local architects but we cannot go abroad and get registered you know uh, as, as an independent architectural firm the, the, the field is not uh, level so I first agree. of all we need to do that like well, I just said well, the I, Indian architects are going to be at a disadvantage at the moment hmm. wait but the same applies in, in Germany if an Indian architect would want to have a project in, in Germany still a German registered architect would be required. Same in India. Uh, any international architect cannot uh, submit uh, building drawings or prepare workshop drawings without support from the associated architect in India. The thing is like in a place like France, right? You mm. can't, any project which is on public money, right, is restricted. You can't just as an Indian architect bid for a tender for a project which is on public money. Private projects are different. In private mm. projects, you can bring an international player, uh, marry him with a local uh, firm and get your project done. But the government for public projects, it actually promotes, you know, uh, you know, the architectural practice by firstly allowing uh, the French uh, architects to work on these uh, public uh, projects. At the same time, they organize global competitions where the French architects compete on an mm. equal footing. So, mm. you know, like uh, the president Mitterrand, he built those 10 great projects, including the uh, pyramid of the loop, right? He had a global competition. French architects competed. Some French architects won some projects. Some global architects won some projects. So the idea of competition, which was just stable, I think that's a very important idea because if we can actually, um, you know, allow uh, have some kind of relationship between other countries, other, uh, you know, states, and the council could take action on that. I believe it's already doing so. Uh, we could actually have some kind of reciprocity. You know, why Richard Rogers and uh, Renzo Piano built their careers as young architects, winning the Pompidou Center among 600 uh, global entrants. Yeah. Why can't Indian firms go out and get a commission like that? So, yeah. Habib, what is your thinking on that subject? No, absolutely they can. As they should, in fact. I mean, for that, I mean, you need to upgrade your thought process, upgrade your services, like it, like it told you. If you, to be very honest, uh, to be very honest, I mean, it may be a controversial statement, but we are not up to that, up to that mark where you can compete globally. I mean, you may be good in your thought process, in your ideas, in your concepts, mm -hmm. but when it comes to deliverance, when it comes to deliverables, we are not, uh, you know, to be honest, I mean, I mean, there might be a couple of, like I told you on my fingers, but uh, uh, not most of them, not the bulk practice. So first we need to upgrade ourselves. And unless we do that, 
because competitions are the only way where you will get merit and you will get you know wide ranging uh, thoughts and concepts on a particular project but uh, uh, it is good to make a concept it's good to make renderings or whatever but the deliverables have to be there for that we need to upgrade ourselves so what about you minani what's your thinking you've been uh, you know you've started overseas and you've come down you've been an educationist here so Tell i us. think um, it's interesting what mr khan is saying that uh, we might not be up to the mark but i also feel that it's not you can't generalize these things it's not like all french architects are great or all italian designers are great right you you'll always have some people who are better than others um some will ex- excel in what they're doing and others may not um and i think it's a matter of giving chances to people who can and the opportunities to do that um and i think what becomes important is that you know a lot of a lot of famous architects didn't get famous by building in their own countries whether it's louis kahn or it's ando or you know whoever okay well ando built a lot in japan but um a lot of people got these opportunities some got them through competition some got them through commissions so i feel that it's you know what what kind of irks me a little bit is just this idea of borders and boundaries and i know that i'm i'm being very idealistic and you know probably in in a utopian state of mind but um it would be great if we could start shedding this a little bit and we start looking at good architecture by good architects irrespective of where they come from um i might be taking this discussion somewhere else but you know recently i was i was reading a series of articles about women architects and this usually comes around during march when you've got women's day and people start to celebrate women architects it's not about male architects or female architects it's about architects right architects who are doing good work so if we can stop kind of binding ourselves in these boundaries if we can drop the labels it would be great because i think that will give us more opportunity and that will level out the playing field a little bit i i completely agree that um, you know we are we are all at different standards i went from doing one year of architecture in delhi and then i went abroad and i started um, my university education again and it was a very deliberate idea to start from first year again but to be very honest with you somebody who excelled in everything that uh, she did over here it was a slap across my face because standards are very different in the west right standards are extremely dis- different your processes are very different the way things are taught um it's it's a different approach to architecture and to design and to education having come back and gotten into education for a short period of time here again that comparison was rather stark but the point is that we need to start at some point we need to start somewhere i'm really happy to hear some of the points that mr khan um sort of elaborated on earlier um because i've had a pet peeve with uh, with the coa and then and i'll kind of voice it here if i can um but i i had a five year professional degree that i completed in canada i came back to india and i haven't been able to get a license right and it's only because the original list of universities from where degrees were recognized has not been amended in so many years that this one one university which is recognized all across the world is not in the list of the coas recognized universities because of which i have been in the country for over a decade i'm not practicing anymore so i don't need to sign papers but i've been here for over a decade without a license i still call myself an architect because i think i've earned that but i have nothing to show in india unfortunately I have heart for a couple of months <laughs> Yes. I I would reach reach out to almost... you. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's that's very important, you know. Uh, Swen, would you like to say a few things? Now maybe? Yes, 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 we can hear you now. We can hear you. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um yeah, I I shared the same experience. I uh, attempted twice to register as an architect uh, with the um Council of Architects in Delhi, but uh, same issue the university where i studied in germany is not uh, recognized or is not uh, accredited mm-hmm. and this is why um, we uh, have to uh, appoint always a municipal architect to process the building permissions see i understand i mean i understand the concerns there are so many of uh, people like you who are in the same boat uh, the 
schedule is called is not been amended since probably you know 40 years now why i don't know why it was not done but it has been now taken up it is with the ministry and uh, very soon we're going to have a foreign qualification committee which will look into this compile a new list and the schedule will be amended so i think a couple of months uh, down the line your your issues would be say, probably addressed too i would like to say uh, a couple of things uh, one is i was in the us for some years uh, in the late 80s and the early 90s and the kind of work that we used to do there the kind of architectural practice services that we do uh, we most of the offices uh, out here in our country are still not doing it i mean mm. I'm, I'm being harsh probably but we're not doing it that that is a very important aspect that we need to upgrade ourselves second is when you talk of reciprocal basis when you talk of uh, uh, what you call uh, like a visa you know you have arrival and visa with a particular country so you also give arrival to a particular country when you come into india so when you when you have a reciprocal arrangement with any country for uh, licensing or registration it, it, the same process is followed because that's the government's policy yes i think uh, uh, well one question uh, habib what is an indian architect you know is an indian architect an architect who is born indian with a foreign degree or is an indian architect an architect who's uh, studied in an indian university or is an indian architect an architect who passes the exam of the council of architects of india you know what defines the indian architect we, that person is going to be very lucky because all projects of 200 crores are going to be done by him so i really want to know who he is does anybody on the panel qualify <laughs> <laughs> well well i do uh, i do <laughs> i will answer this this question in two parts one as the president of the council and the other as an architect uh, as a president of the council uh, indian architect is the one who has done a five year undergraduate b arch degree from an indian recognized school and uh, is registered with the council of architecture he is a indian architect or someone who has done uh, a degree from the schedule which is mentioned like uh, both of you guys are saying Uh, from the schedule, if you are uh, scheduled, the university is listed in those schedules. If you are graduate from there, then you can be you can be registered. So that's the definition of the Indian architect at the moment, as far as the Council of Architecture is concerned. But to me, uh, personally, I mean, not as not an official statement, but personally, every every person who is able to think or conceive about the spaces about the volumes about the forms about the materials about the details about the relationship between all this about the user the value the social aspects you know any person who is who is able to do that is an architect absolutely well, that's fantastic i i think i i fully support you in that lalita i have a question for you you know uh, you've been collaborating and you've been working with people overseas and in india you know the question is that when you work overseas and i think swen will also talk a little bit about that you know what is the kind of industry support that you have you know when you're working on those projects and what is the comparative industry support that you have in india you know swen was also speaking about the construction the fly in the specification vendors please enlighten us a little bit about the construction environment in which we are all working absolutely to begin with uh, as as uh, habib has been saying and as writing minali has been saying uh, the first point comes is where we can make a difference as indian architects or or as architects to design well is purely first we need to really introspect as habib has said design research plays a very 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 important role overall in creating uh, designs which are worth talking about uh and of course uh, the industry support makes a huge lot of difference because you can then uh, think about new materials uh, new details uh, and new ways of construction which unfortunately doesn't happen in our country and that's that's a big problem because you need to have uh, so this happens across uh, the site whether be it the size of the project doesn't matter internationally uh, like as as i was showing uh, the uh, kennedy uh, the israeli uh, lounge it's a very very tiny project it had a great budget no doubt about it but it's a very small project but we in fact explored a very new material over there we contacted uh, we, you know uh, the manufacturers internet who are based internationally we wanted a very specific uh, type uh, of modulations to be done to that material 
and they were willing to do it. And if the same thing happens over here in the country, what they ask is the numbers. What are the numbers? You know, what's what's the kind of uh, the size of the uh, uh, you know uh, we are we are kind of what kind of uh, project whether it's going to be viable for them to even do a small research or not because at the end of the day they want large numbers to be able to support you in the smallest of the ways so industry support and industry integration with uh, designers and architects is abysmal in our country unfortunately uh, so is the case in terms of the construction industry aspect to try to do something new uh, that it's like huge cost the moment you have to kind of research uh, doing a small detail change or doing a complex detail uh, you really need to uh, being as architects you really need to shell out uh, money from your own pockets to really uh, and sometimes it's not viable you know it's it's really not viable for us to do that so then you have to look at alternatives so uh, frankly uh, these are certain things that really uh, push us back uh, uh, to really produce uh, works which are commendable, which are uh, globally uh, comparable. So those are something which is very, very important that we need to have uh, designed research, uh, industry integration uh, and industry support, uh, which is highly essential to produce any quality work, uh, whether be it design or, or in terms of execution. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, just now Lalita was speaking about you know, the uh, uh, research and the uh, feedbacks that one uh, gets uh, from the industry. And uh, she was mentioning how it was, uh, you know, quite challenging in terms of the feedback one gets uh, out here. Uh, you remember when we first worked on a project together, uh, we had to look for rose colored concrete, you know, and uh, well, this was a project by Fosters and we were uh, collaborating, Sven and I, and uh, Fosters came up with this concept in Bang in Mumbai to design with a rose tinted concrete. And we went all over India looking for how we can, uh, uh, you know, uh, make rose tinted concrete happen and a completely prefabricated building happen, you know. And uh, mm -hmm. what helped was that there was uh, a, an international expert on concrete coming into the uh, team. There was an Indian expert on concrete dialoguing with him and everybody was sitting across the table and trying to find a way to make that work so Sven you could share some thoughts about that yeah that uh, that was really a, a challenge and uh, when bringing in international consultants to India the, the main challenge is they don't understand that we do things differently in India so Many times they try to explain us how it should be done in India, and then we are saying, well, but that is not we are, how we are working here. So they firstly have to adopt to our challenges. So same with this concrete, this international consultant only for concrete, he, he came with millions of things uh, we should uh, consider during the execution, while that was just not possible since uh, since we have limited um, materials, limited techniques available. So um, at the end, the only solution was to change the design in order to adopt our um, conditions in India. And same we've been facing with many other projects that um, we do things differently in India and obviously the international consultants and engineers have to adopt these standards. And uh, this is why many things are uh, done differently. Yeah, I think that's uh, well, that's a very uh, thing. And actually, when you dialogue together, right, you sometimes come up with something completely different. Like, you know, uh, I remember when we were doing the airport in Hyderabad, mm. the whole idea of having outside an airport, this airport village, it was it's not done. It was never done before. It's supposed to be a secure zone. But we said in India, you need this. And actually, this is a very, very viable marketplace for you. And it went wrong because everybody came just to see the airport. And this whole yeah. airport village was completely crowded. So it, it, you learn. And while working in Africa, we, I, I do a lot of work. I love Africa. I love working there. But 
working there as well. I find it very fascinating to actually uh, work with these foreign cultures. And as Menominee said, right, you know, you have to think international, mm. right? You may be working local, but with a thinking that is global, you know, mm. you should be always doing something which is in good reference to the context. So mm. uh, I'm, I'm very glad that We've kind of had so many different perspectives today and so many different thoughts and ideas. Um, our time is up, unfortunately. And uh, I would look forward, Javi, to all the future directions that the Council of Architects takes. Uh, we'll all back you and we'll hope that you yes, move in uh, direction. Uh, and Rinalini, keep pleasure. going with pleasure, promoting pleasure. Indian, Thank architecture, you so much. And Indian architecture. So when, you. In, uh, you know, integrating Indian architecture and international architecture together in India and across the world. And Lalita, you collaborating globally. Thank you, everyone. And it was wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.